Welcome to Fitch Ratings Fixed Interests Podcast. I am your host, Justin Patry, and today the topic is global emerging markets. And I'm very pleased to have with me Duncan Innes Kerr, a senior director with the Fitch Wire team based in Hong Kong. And Duncan is the author of the quarterly global EM credit brief report published by Fitch Ratings. Welcome, Duncan. So let's start with global rates, because the rate cycle has begun to turn in developed markets, most recently um, with the U.S. Fed cut in September. So how is that affecting credit conditions in emerging markets, Duncan? Thanks, Justin. I think in general, many regard it as a positive for emerging market credit conditions. U.S. dollar borrowing costs in particular are a key benchmark for the cost of foreign currency debt issuance. Uh, so as the Fed cuts rates, it should generally reduce the burden of repaying and ease the process of refinancing US dollar debt for emerging market issuers. Um, but that said, a lot of borrowers are still going to be refinancing debt that was issued a few years ago when rates were much lower. Uh, so new issuance may still lead to higher overall interest costs for some time. It's also worth noting that the reason why the rates in the US and Europe are now falling is because they've done their work in slowing the economy, uh, which means that emerging market issuers that have demand exposure to those markets are going to be feeling those effects, uh, and that's going to be quite painful. The other thing that's worth noting is that uh, the emerging world is not one big block. Many emerging markets were ahead of developed markets in raising rates in the first place. So some are now pausing or even thinking about raising rates, as Brazil did last month. And for those issuers whose borrowing is mostly in local currencies, these trends in local rate cycles will be more important than those in developed markets. All right, so let's stick with some developed market themes for, for EMs. The U.S. election is, is obviously a big watch item. What are some of the key issues from the U.S. election to watch for EM issuers? I think the really big one is trade policy. Um, if the Republicans secure control of government, there's a risk of fairly dramatic increases in tariffs, uh, which they've committed to. There's been a lot of discussion around the potential that Donald Trump might impose uh, 10% tariffs on all imports uh, and 60% tariffs on imports from China in particular. But that's not a hard commitment. And it's been quite difficult to pin down the level of tariffs that they're actually looking to introduce but certainly his first term does give grounds to think that the broad tariff actions are certainly possible. Chinese companies in particular are exposed to that. Uh, we believe it's particularly so in sectors such as technology, hardware, uh, automotives uh, and new energy manufacturing. But it's a concern for exporters across the emerging world, particularly so in places like Mexico, action that disrupts uh, the, the USMCA could hit local companies quite hard. And major trade actions by the US could also have quite significant impacts on global growth prospects, which would affect uh, emerging market issuers more generally. And certainly if they affect inflation and monetary policy in the US, that would also have ripple effects across emerging markets more broadly. We also think that there is a possibility that Republican government could uh, lead to some significant shifts in uh, US climate policy, which might potentially change market expectations around demand for some key commodities especially for things like uh, new energy supply chain, commodities like copper and uh, lithium. Yeah, so you mentioned China there. Let's pivot to China as, as, a, as a wider emerging markets theme. So the domestic demand in China has struggled to reaccelerate, but there were some quite notable stimulus announcements recently. How much does China demand weakness matter for other emerging markets? Yes, uh, Fitch did some scenario analysis earlier this year around which economies would be most exposed uh, if China were to experience a substantial economic slowdown. And I should say that we're not expecting to see anything like that scenario to pan out at this stage. Uh, but that research really highlighted that it's Asian economies and commodity exporters uh, globally that are particularly vulnerable to China's demand weakness. Emerging markets, that includes places like Vietnam and Malaysia, where supply chains are very closely linked uh, with China as well as commodity exporters like Peru, Zambia, Chile, and Indonesia. And within China itself, what are some of the key credit ratings and trends across sectors that you've been noticing? I think last month was a really interesting one for our ratings in China um, and kind of highlighted a lot of the trends that we've seen uh, over the last quarter. The persistent problems in the property sector were very much apparent, highlighted by another developer downgrade when we took China Vanke to B plus from BB minus uh, due to lower than expected sales and uh, cash flow generation. And Vanke remains on negative outlook uh, due partly to uncertainty around the prospects for stabilization in the sector. Um, but we also saw upgrades for consumer-oriented firms like Heidi Lau and Meituan, uh, and that was based on our expectation for stable or improving profitability and measured capex. Uh, so there are definitely still some bright spots. But that all said, uh, across our portfolio of China-based issuers, 
negative outlooks outnumber positive outlooks uh, by a wide margin uh, as of late September, uh, as high as uh, 128 uh, negative to two positive. This chiefly reflects the fact that the uh, the negative outlook on China's A plus sovereign rating sort of ripples across the portfolio, largely because the, there's a very high number of entities where uh, there are links to the sovereign rating. There are assumptions around uh, the likelihood of, of sovereign support uh, in extremis. Talking about the the stimulus plan specifically, we're still waiting for some more detail about the fiscal element of that. We think that the fiscal element is going to be particularly important. Uh, in assessing what sort of impact that the package as a whole will have. But I think so far what we can say is that uh, monetary easing has progressed a little faster than we'd expected. And that's going to put some additional pressure on bank uh, net interest margins and profitability. At the same time, lower deposit rates and reserve requirement ratios are going to be uh, taking down bank funding costs. So that will mitigate the impact on profitability a little bit. And importantly, on the Upside, we do think that the authorities' plans to enhance common equity uh, at the six state banks signal a commitment to keeping bank financial metrics stable, partly to enable those banks to uh, play a, a key role in supporting the economy. Um, but that that's a good signal. Okay, so we've talked about rates and the election, the U.S. election and, and China. So are there any other key themes or, or risks to watch for global emerging market credit and ratings performance over the next year that you think should be mentioned? I think the obvious theme beyond the, uh, the U.S. election and the developed market rate cycle turning that we've not mentioned is geopolitical risk. We have major conflicts underway uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we've, of course, seen uh, that rippling across the oil markets in the last day or so, as well as in, in Ukraine and Russia at the moment. And there's there's several other hotspots in, uh, like that in the South China Sea where the frequency of incidents is quite alarming. And so any one of these could escalate in ways that would affect issuers across the emerging market universe uh, and, and mostly for the worse. That said, we've seen relatively positive momentum across emerging markets and aggregates so far over 2024. And that's been reflected in in fairly strong issuance, particularly in markets like Turkey and the Middle East. And we do expect economic prospects across the emerging world to remain pretty supportive in the near term, particularly in the Middle East and Africa, where growth is uh, expected to accelerate in 2025. Well, thank you very much, Duncan. I hope everyone who's listening has enjoyed the latest Fixed Interest podcast for this week. As always, to learn more about Fitch's ratings and credit views, please visit our website at fitchratings.com.